Thank you, Roberto. And I want to thank the organizers for asking me to come back again to beautiful Barcelona and share some thoughts with you. Uh, I was given a very easy task, and that was uh, simply to talk about uh, how you choose your initial therapy for patients with metastatic disease. I'm going to begin with a little bit of a political statement, and that is that if you look at the U.S. data, we're winning the war on cancer if you really think about the major causes of cancer-related mortality. If you think about uh, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, the death rates are dropping dramatically. And this is just the most mature data ending in 2010. Now there's been a more major investment in the management of those cancers. And as this is happening, we see an incidence increasing in pancreatic cancer, and yet not a major change in, in management. Some improvement, no doubt, but not a major change. So that by possibly this year, Pancreatic cancer, as I think Manny might have pointed out, uh, may become the second most common cause of cancer-related death. And as the incidence increases and these other improvements in other cancers uh, in, in decrease in age-adjusted mortality rates, we may see pancreatic cancer being the most common cause of cancer-related death, in the, at least in the United States. And I suspect our experience is mirrored elsewhere. So it's really time for our legislators to think about this and to invest more in, uh, in funding for pancreas cancer research. Uh, I've just said this. Some of the things I've talked about have been talked about by others, so I can catch up on a little bit of time. I will say, though, that um, um, Marco Bruno's uh, data from the EU is not uh, quite the same as what we see in the US. We actually now see a cure rate of 7% overall. That's not good enough, I'm the first to say that, but I think that we are um, seeing some gradual creep uh, of improvement, uh, overall improvement in this disease. But I will point out that for patients with uh, metastatic disease who are not able to undergo treatment, the median survival is only about three months, underscoring the aggressive behavior of this malignancy. We don't know why it's so aggressive, and one can postulate that it might be because it's diagnosed so late because there aren't early symptoms. But increasingly, I think we are appreciating that there is very early invasion and metastasis, as uh, the example of the resected patient um, with the small primary uh, exemplified. And then we see this disease as being somewhat chemo-resistant. I think that is changing clearly, but this disease may be in a sanctuary site where there, the, uh, this stroma whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage to the host, uh, could be at least a partial barrier to treatment and particularly to the delivery of large molecules. And finally, don't forget that this, pa this disease disables this patient in a way that no other epithelial malignancy does. So these patients tend to be more frail and more disabled by their cancer than other patients that we treat, so that the ability of the usual cancer patient to, pancreatic cancer patient, to take the therapies that we so easily give uh, to other types of cancer patients is somewhat limited. Uh, we didn't talk so much about the biology of this disease, and I won't go into too much detail here, but just to remember that the cell of origin is probably in the asini. The asini undergoes asinoreductal metaplasia. Then we see increasing um, uh, mutations occur and increasing dysplasia. And we know a lot about the biology of the premalignant process. What we know very little about is the biology of invasion and metastasis. And when we think about where we could intervene in, in terms of a stabilizing uh, measure short of surgery in patients at high risk for disease, either because of pan information or pre-malignant tumors, uh, that could be a, make a huge impact. So a focus, I think, in our, uh, in our uh, biologic studies on invasion and metastasis would be very, very, um, very much welcome. Now, I want to talk a little bit about diversity in this disease. There is diversity in this disease. There's diversity on, a clinical, uh, on clinical grounds, and there's diversity on biologic grounds. This is a, a very important study that was done by Christine Iacobuzzi O'Donohue at Johns Hopkins, and she based her study on an autopsy series, a warm autop autopsy series that she had collected at Johns Hopkins. And she defined two different classes of patients. One class of patient had patients with basically very locally destructive growth of the tumor and very minimal or no metastatic disease. 
And then she defined another type of patient with very locally confined disease in the pancreas, but yet with widespread mega metastatic disease. So you could imagine if we could understand the differences between this, these two patient populations, we would be uh, far better at tailoring our therapy. And that gets back to the SMAD4 uh, loss that uh, was just mentioned by Pascal and the trial that Chris Crane is doing in which they are stratifying to SMAD4 strat, uh, status and looking at uh, how these patients uh, uh, do with either chemotherapy alone or with chemotherapy plus radiation. Then in our own group, Eric Collison has identified subclasses of adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, much like we think of subclasses in breast cancer. He's identified an acinar subclass, a quasimesenchymal subclass, and a classical subclass. I also think of it as an epithelial subclass. We know these subclasses behave differently. We're not so sure about the acinar, but we do think there are differences in the classical and quasimesenchymal subclasses. And we think this can track with therapy. So for instance, we have cell lines that are gemcitabine sensitive that typically fall into the mesenchymal subclass. And, and, sub, and, and cell lines that are sensitive to erlotinib that fall into the classical subclass. And yet, despite efforts like these, we haven't yet been able to come up with clinical useful biomarkers for treatment selection in this disease. And I would argue that that's something that's sorely needed. So let's get back to what I was assigned to do, the management of metastatic disease and how you select therapy. This shows you the therapies that uh, we have available and the timeline, and I thank uh, Phil Phillips for giving me this slide. Let's talk about Fulferinox. You've heard a lot about it already in this session. This was a typical uh, randomized trial design versus gemcitabine monotherapy. It was exclusively in patients with metastatic disease with a high performance status. The results were nothing less than dramatic. Um, a hazard ratio of 0.57 is the type of hazard ratio for overall survival that we would like to see in every trial that we do. But this prize, if you will, this improvement in overall survival has come with some cost. And the cost is that it's a very tough regimen with dominating toxicities of myelosuppression, diarrhea, and neuropathy. Now we're make, getting better at making Falfirinox reasonable or tolerable. Uh, we omit the bolus 5-FU now. We often reduce the doses. We use chemotherapy holidays. We're still figuring it out, if you will. And I think as more trials are done with, well, with Fulfirinox-like regimens, we will finally settle into a regimen that is tolerable for more patients. Now the second regimen is gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel. This was a similar trial design against gemcitabine monotherapy. This did include patients with a slightly lower performance status. And unlike the Fulfirinox trial, this was a global trial. So this was done in all parts of the world with uh, arguably variable, uh, uh, variable access to the supportive care that this patient population needs. Now the uh, overall survival benefit with this trial was not quite as dramatic as what we saw with Fulfirinox, but it was very respectable. I think a clinically meaningful um, hazard ratio of anything less than 0.75 has to be taken very seriously. Now this still is not an easy regimen to take. It's easier to manage than Fulfirinox, but it's not a walk in the park. So we still see problems with myelosuppression and with uh, neuropathy, a different form of neuropathy, but a neuropathy nonetheless. So I'm often asked, which is better, and why don't we compare these? And I know that there are some efforts out there, and we just heard from, about some. Um, I don't think these particular two studies can be compared. And the biggest reason was the, the um, global nature of the uh, trial with gemcitabine and abraxane. Uh, Fulfirinox was tested in a region of France uh, of it that is fairly uh, densely populated with good access to supportive care. When you do a global trial, you're never going to see the same kind of results that you might see with a regional trial or even more so with an institutional trial. The eligibility was a little different, but when you look at the control arms, they, they seem to perform uh, about the same. So I'm not sure the patient population mattered so much. <laughs> 
So as I said, this is not a contest. I don't like to think about it like that because I like to think about the fact that for the first time in my career, I have two options that I can talk to patients about. And I can give them a toxicity scale. Uh, we also use gemcitabine and capecitabine in patients who um, are not fit enough for more combination regimens or who are not willing to um, have the toxicity that these regimens um, bring. Uh, we do look at the, uh, the differences in, um, in objective response rates sometimes to think about our, our decision making, but really when we select treatment, we're considering the comorbidity in the patients, the patient preference, what type of toxicity they would tolerate, uh, what the goal of treatment is. Uh, very important, the compatibility with investiga investigational agents as we're designing trials to move forward. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned before, the predictive biomarkers that we wish we had and I think we will have going forward. When you think about um, toxicity, this is how I, I describe it to patients. Um, I, I give them this sort of menu and this is what they can expect. And you'll be surprised at patients who will um, actually opt for fulferinox just because they don't want to lose their hair. I have patients who, who play the fiddle and they don't want uh, a chance of irreversible neuropathy. So it's very easy to sit down with a patient and walk through these things. If you think about other factors that might be a little bit more subtle and perhaps not the same factors that a patient might consider, uh, the first is age. I, I don't give any of these regimens, either of these regimens, to patients over the age of 80. Patients over the age of 80 may look very fit, but they are frail. Uh, between 70 and 80, I might use fulferinox. Pretty much I can I get away with using gemcitabine and abraxane or nabpaclitaxel. Performance status sways me a little bit. I have occasional patients who have no symptoms at all. So then I'm thinking, well, should I give them a regimen that has a very high uh, toxicity rate? I'm going to make them symptomatic. So I'm more likely to give an asymptomatic patient gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel. If patients have incomplete biliary decompensation, it's definitely going to be gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel. And if they live very far from their, um, from their, the, the clinic that treats them, and this is very common in the United States to have great distances, that we will tend to use an alternate week regimen and arrange to have the pump disconnected at home for, for, for Firinox, and we're less likely to recommend gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel because of the more frequent uh, requirement for visits to the clinic. Now, there are other options on our NCCN guidelines, and I just wanted to mention these quickly. As, as I said before, we often use gemcitabine and capecitabine for, uh, for more elderly patients, but who are still fit enough to have more than uh, gemcitabine monotherapy. Gemcitabine and cisplatin is a preferred option for patients with uh, mutations and DNA repair pathways. The GTX regimen, which is fixed dose rate gemcitabine, um, uh, capecitabine, and Taxotere is very commonly used. It's a highly active regimen, but it has never been compared to gemcitabine monotherapy. And while we have gemcitabine and erlotinib still on our uh, list of recommendations, it's now at a less preferred level. So moving forward, we need to be able to build on both these regimens if we want to advance care even more. And surely none of us are happy uh, with the state of our management as it is. Now I looked into um, what is happening in the real world in terms of uh, how agents are being combined with these various regimens. Uh, in the database that's, access that's available to me, there are 54 open trials in all phases, phase one through three. Only two of those trials incorporate fulferinox. And if you look at randomized phase two or phase three studies, there's only one with fulferinox, and that's the uh, PEG-PH20, the hyaluronidase. But there are a number of trials that are a building on gemcitabine and, and nabpaclitaxel as a backbone. So I think we're seeing a trend that, um, that this may be an easier regimen to work with in terms of adding additional drugs. Now we have a situation uh, that's a good one in patients with metastatic disease, and that is that we often get very deep responses, but patients can't continue on with therapy with the full schedule, uh, full doses because of cumulative toxicity. This has given us the idea that we may be able to use that maintenance 
period as a window of opportunity for, for clinical trials. Our routine at UCSF is to take patients off treatment at, at about six months and just simply observe them and let them have a chemotherapy holiday until their disease progresses and we need to resume treatment. But it would be nice to have something to offer those patients in the interim. And so we've gone ahead, for instance, with an immunotherapy trial in collaboration with Johns Hopkins where we're randomizing patients to um, a vaccine, GVAX, and ipilimumab uh, compared to ongoing, um, easy to manage maintenance chemotherapy. And that would be uh, uh, capecitabine in this case. But I think that this, the fact that we can do this trial and we're actively accruing to this trial suggests that you can use this maintenance period as a window of opportunity to troll for activity of new drugs. And are there new drugs that are poised to move into frontline? Well, we're going to see, I think, the appro approval of liposomal or irena -tecan. And we have seen very encouraging early results in second line with rexalitinib, a very easy to tolerate JAK-STAT inhibitor that could, uh, I believe, uh, probably be combined very safely with fulferinox or with gemcitabine and paclitaxel. And finally, I want to leave you with this thought. While we have a lot of uh, activity uh, in the area of trying to find drugs, for instance, that will disable RAS, one of the drivers of this, uh, this disease, we also have to consider genetic uh, heterogeneity and think about the fact that adaptive immunity uh, may be our best asset in controlling disease progression. And so in that uh, spirit, I'm a member of a Stand Up to Cancer Dream team in which we're evaluating a number of immunological parameters parameters, any of which could be easily moved into a frontline setting in combination with uh, even very uh, aggressive uh, chemotherapy regimens. So I'm, very act I'm actually very encouraged that we're going to be able to move the bar. So I, I will summarize by saying that we now have multiple options for stabilizing chemotherapy, and it's only because of those options that we can begin to explore other new investigational strategies. I didn't talk about it, but the NCI is investing a huge uh, amount of resources into uh, drugs that will disable RAS, and we believe that in, at least in a segment of the patients, a subset of the patients, a RAS continues to be a driver for maintenance. We are seeing the, um, a serious effort to address stromal targets, especially immune-related targets. And finally, we've got an opportunity to do these window of opportunity trials, and I would encourage you all to think about that option so that we can uh, just make more progress and make it faster. Thank you very much.